Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and thank you very much for um, attending my keynote uh, speech. I hope it is a keynote that I'm uh, delivering. Um, I was asked to survey um, the critiques or the opposition to the concept of a United States of Europe. And when I received this invitation, I was honored to be invited, but I thought, well, why should I actually be competent in surveying um, this type of um, critique? I would rather like to present my own view on um, what the United States of Europe might be and why it is perhaps not such a good idea. Uh, so I asked uh, the organizers to change the topic of my intervention uh, a little bit uh, and suggested that I would rather speak about, um, well, why should the European Union not become the United States of Europe? But when I prepared this keynote speech, I found, uh, thinking about the reasons which I would like to advance, that it's actually a useful exercise uh, to also survey other points of views which are critical of the concept of a United States of Europe. So while I put some effort in changing the topic of the speech, I will now actually come back to the original suggestion and also give some ideas, at least the way I read them, on other people's um, objections to what uh, might be hidden behind these just first United States of Europe. Well, actually, um, the United States of Europe in some sense is a non-topic because nobody, as far as I see, at least no serious politician, is suggesting to build a United States of Europe right now or even in the more distant um, future. What is enshrined, though, in the European treaties is the concept of ever closer union. And you know probably that this uh, concept of as ever closer union enshrined in the European treaties and uh, ratified by all member states of the, United, uh, of, of the European Union, that this concept is not undisputed, um, not even among uh, member states. Um, because uh, while the British government under a Labour uh, Prime Minister um, approved of this concept of ever closer union, the Conservative le leadership of the United Kingdom did not uh, approve of that. So the Conservative Party was in opposition at the time when uh, the Lisbon Treaty was negotiated and uh, ratified, but they uh, campaigned heavily against um, this uh, concept and they set out to exempt the United Kingdom from the aim of a ever closer union when they came to power. Actually, it was one of David Cameron's uh, four demands which he submitted to the Council of the European Union to have the United Kingdom exempted from pursuing the goal of an ever closer union. Now, ever closer union is actually a concept which is also not uh, well defined. What exactly does it mean? What what um, um, is the final uh, goal of um, increasing uh, integration. Uh, nobody really knows that. It is uh, not um, settled um, somewhere, but there is in the European treaties this concept of increasing integration further and further. And the problem I see there is that not everybody might um, agree. Uh, to increasing integration, in particular so since increases in integration are also something very vague, um, since you can think of many different areas along which the, United, uh, the, the European Union might integrate further. For instance, um, integration may mean economic integration, or integration may mean an integration of governance, uh, of administration, for instance. It may mean an integration of more integration in terms of security, be it external security or be it internal uh, security. Integration may mean uh, that it is an integration in terms of political stability. Or it may mean that uh, integration has to pay respect, or no, that integration is something which has to protect um, the, uh, the, the cultural and the envi environmental heritage. So in some sense, integration is something which questions how much subsidiarity we will be able to realize in a union which is um, more integrated than the present um, union. What I would like to emphasize, since I have been asked to talk about the equally vague concept of a United States of Europe is, 
that integration is just one part of what one might conceive as the United States of Europe. The other really important uh, part uh, of the state building exercise is actually democratic legitimization and democratic control. So while you can think of many integrating measures along many different dimensions, and I gave a few examples for these, you must also think about what does this mean for the democratic legiti legitimacy of decisions and for the possibilities of democratic uh, control. So this, I think, is a key point which I would like to emphasize in um, uh, the, the following uh, remarks uh, that I will make on objections to the goal of creating a United States of Europe. The other um, key point I would like to make is that the decision on the optim optimal degree of integration along various dimensions, as I have outlined, that this decision can only be made in a democratic process, naturally. So while democracy in itself is not yet fully spelled out, we have not fully spelled out how we will shape the democratic decision-making and control process in the European Union if it integrates further, on the other hand, the degree of integration along several dimensions needs to be made in a democratic pr procedure, otherwise it wouldn't have no democratic legitimization. Therefore, if the European state is not democratically legitimized, so if a hypothetical European state, the United States of Europe, is not democratically legitimized, we cannot find the optimal degree of integration. There are two critiques of a European state, or of the United States of Europe, which assert that a European state would not be democratically legitimized. And therefore, it should not exist. So these are two critiques which I will spell out a little bit uh, more precisely uh, in, in just a minute. But I just wanted sort of to, to um, lay out the structure of my speech here. Two particular types of critique assert that a European state cannot be democratically legitimized, and therefore, because we are all Democrats, obviously, a European state should not exist. I will call these two critiques the nationalist critique and the democratic uh, critique, and I will spell, spell them out in a minute, as I've said. There are two other critiques directed at integration rather than at democratic legitimization, two other critiques of the concept of a European state. These critiques assert um, that a European state would necessarily go along with a suboptimal level of integration and should therefore not exist. Not for democratic reasons, but for the simple reason that the level of integration which we would achieve in a European state would not be the optimal level of integration. I call these two critiques the economic critique and the Marxist critique. The former, the economic critique, focuses on the common currency and the latter on the common market. Interestingly, there is some area of overlap between the nationalist and the democratic critique, and there's also some area of overlap between the economic and the Marxist uh, critique. There may naturally be more uh, critiques, but I will focus on these uh, four because I think they are the most important ones. Their proponents uh, do not always phrase these critiques in a way I find intellectually appealing, I have uh, to say. In fact, sometimes a critique is phrased in a way which is rather intellectually appalling. But I take the liberty uh, and try to unearth uh, from a number of uh, sometimes inconsistent and unconvincing and sometimes almost incomprehensible political statements the bottom line, which I think may make a valid point or at least deserves a thought. So here I go. The nationalist critique runs, according to my reading, as follows. There is no European people. Europe is a continent made up of many, many different peoples. Democracy, however, is a valid decision instrument within a people or within a nation. Nationalists are not so very clear about the distinction between peoples and, and, and nations, but, but let's just forget about this distinction currently. They say, though, that people or nations should be sovereign in their decisions. 
Hence, they say, democracy cannot be a legitimate decision instrument at European level, because there is no European people, there is no European nation. It therefore violates the fundamental freedom of a people or of a nation if it is subject to the will of other peoples and other nations, being dominated in a democratic decision-making process, not being able to make its own decisions democratically because they are in a minority position vis-a-vis -vis all the other peoples in the Union. As this is an argument which relates to freedom, it is also actually an argument which is sometimes made by liberals or by libertarians. There's some overlap between liberal thinking here and nationalist thinking, and actually some people consider them national liberals or something like that. So this is the nationalist critique which essentially says democracy is not a legitimate decision instrument in a region which is comprised of many different peoples or nations. The democratic critique, the second critique I would like to uh, illustrate, sort of reverts the argument. It says, democracy is in principle a legitimate decision tool at European level, but the European Union is not democratic because the European Parliament is not elected with equal voting rights which is true. Just to give you an example, small member states, are states, small member states of the European Union are grossly overrepresented in the European Parliament and large member states are grossly underrepresented. For instance, our smallest member state, Malta, has six members of the European Parliament. If we had the one man, one vote principle in the elections to the European Parliament, then the German population should actually be represented by a thousand members of the European Parliament. That's the right relation between the Maltese voters and, and, and the German uh, voters. Six in Malta would make a thousand here. In fact, Germany has 96 uh, deputies in the European Parliament. So Malta is overrepresented in the European Parliament by a factor of 10, right? And all larger nations, Germany is just, just one example, all larger member states are underrepresented as compared to the smaller uh, member states. So while it would be obviously possible to introduce equal voting rights in Europe if we want to create a European state, this would marginalize the, members, the small member states in parliament and thereby spur the nationalist critique and jeopardize political stability. So the democratic argument says the status quo is that Europe is not democratic because it violates the one man, one vote principle in, in Parliament. But if we were to introduce equal voting rights, which is easy uh, to do, then this would not be acceptable to the smaller member states. So we cannot uh, do it. And this conflict is we cannot solve. That's the, the, the critique. Clearly, Unless equal voting is accepted throughout the Union, the Union cannot tax and fiscal policy must remain within the member states. That's the, the old slogan of the American uh, Revolution, no taxation without representation. So if we don't have fair representation in the European Parliament, then we cannot transfer from parliaments which are fairly elected, so national parliaments where the one man, one vote principle is uh, uh, realized, we cannot transfer taxation powers and uh, spending powers to the European Union, and therefore we cannot have a European state. That's the democratic uh, critique. While these two critiques um, are different, both critiques have their roots in the concept of nations, for which democracy or equal voting rights would not be acceptable because the nations would not have enough say in their own uh, affairs. So in some sense, they both relate to the concept of a nation as a building block of the European Union. I move on to the economic uh, critique and then to the Marxist. The economic critique essentially says that a European state needs to issue a single currency and apply a single monetary policy. I know of no state which has more than one currency or more than, more than one monetary policy. This, however, the existence of a single currency in a region which is very heterogeneous is inappropriately because productivity growth is grossly unequal across the Union. 
with fixed exchange rates due to the fact that there's just one currency. This is equivalent to having fixed exchange rates. With fixed exchange rates and sticky wages, a single market requires adjustments for low productivity growth regions in terms either of lower wages or in terms of higher unemployment. And that's a political problem for the union if whole regions suffer from high unemployment or from falling uh, wages. Whole, whole regions or whole countries, coincidentally perhaps countries. This is particularly so when productive regions use their productivity growth to reduce unemployment rather than increase wages. This is what we have done in Germany, right? Wages in Germany have not risen by much, even though our economy is in a fairly good uh, shape. Rather, we have reduced unemployment. So since German wages didn't increase much, wages in the low productivity regions of the European Union had to go down, right? Particularly, say, in crisis countries like uh, in, in Greece. And the fact that Germany does not increase its wages has something to do with competition on the world market where, you know, higher wages would be um, um, an impediment uh, to um, selling our, our, our goods there. So, while a European state with a single currency is possible, very clearly possible, it would be economically suboptimal. It would not be optimal for the Union to have just one currency. A common fiscal policy or a transfer union could would not solve the problem um, because the differences in productivity growth would still prevail. It would only be a remedy for its symptoms and would distort economic uh, incentives. The bottom line of this critique is a single European state has less policy instruments than a confederacy of states and will, given the heterogeneity of the union, therefore be economically less successful. Therefore, the degree of integration is suboptimal. That's the, the heart of the economic um, critique. Hence, integration beyond a certain level is counterproductive in terms of income generation. I emphasize generation here because the Marxist critique will focus on income distribution, right? And I come to the Marxist critique now. A European state, according to Marxists, would be opposed to workers' interests and the conditions for class struggle would deteriorate. Why is this so? Well, this is because capitalists operating in a single market find it easy to play out the interests of workers in one country against the interests of workers in another country. Business interests, however, are often transnational, so they do not suffer from the same type of rivalry as the interests of workers or, or laborers do. Capitalists want a big open market. They do not care where they earn their money. Workers, however, care about the conditions in the state they live in. So their interests are more closely related to national uh, interests. But differences in national interests of workers weaken their political power at the EU level. So according to the Marxist argument, as I understand it, European decision making is biased, is biased towards crony capitalism. Right? Capitalists find it easier to realize their objectives, their interests in European policy making decisions than workers do because workers are not united in their objectives. Um, they, are, they, they are rivals across countries or nations. The bottom line of this argument is a single European market gives entrepreneurs a competitive edge over workers in terms of policy making and will therefore result in suboptimal distribution of income. Income will accrue to a greater extent to capitalists than to workers, to a greater extent than legitimate to capitalists than uh, to workers. Hence, integration, and here it is, economic integration beyond a certain level is counterproductive in terms of income distribution, whereas the economic critique said counterproductive in terms of income generation. Now, these are the main critiques that I surveyed. And I must say, I find some more appealing than others. In particular, since I'm not a Marxist, uh, I have my trouble with uh, sort of identifying with a Marxist uh, critique. But there are many people who have this type of thinking that they worry about income distribution, about, about the fairness of uh, the income distribution. And I, as an economist, have to admit that very clearly the opening up of markets, either in a worldwide scenario, say the globalization, or in an internal market 
scenario like we have it in the European Union is something which typically leads to a spread in the income distribution and is detrimental to the low skilled workers, at least if countries are involved, which, are, which have plenty of, of high skilled uh, works then the, the, the competition by low-skilled uh, workers, which is possible through the opening up of borders and the lowering of, um, um, of external uh, protection, depresses the wages of low-skilled workers and therefore spreads out uh, the income distribution. Now, the economic critique and the um, Marxist critique um, are very different, actually, but both have the same root again, namely in the concept of heterogeneity within the European Union. Either heterogeneity in terms of productivity growth or in terms of workers' interests. Both types of heterogeneity, however, correlate with structural features of the member states and that thus they can be easily mistaken or even be misused as clashing along national lines. There are some leftist politicians, think of Monsieur Mélenchon for instance, which, who also play the nationalist um, card and defend sort of the interests of their workers. Although this heterogeneity is actually about the conditions for economic production and about social conditions, both of which are not directly national, but it can be mistaken that way. Now, in my view, at least some of these critiques have some valid points. Some of these points I find more valid than others, but none, none of them I would discard um, right away. I would rather think uh, about the question whether we have good answers to these concerns. And my assessment is we do not. We do not, not have a good answer for the problems of national sovereignty and democratic rule in the multinational state, critiques number one and two. And we do not have a good answer on how to deal with heterogeneities which under the mechanisms of a single state would give rise to inferior generation of income and possibly a distribution of income which is perceived as unfair by major groups in the population. If we do not have convincing answers, we refrain from going away uh, where these, qu we should uh, refrain from going away where these questions will come up. Because we have achieved a lot in the, European, in the process of European unification. But we also had to learn the lesson that some steps of integration, for instance a common currency and a common asylum system, have not worked well and have caused major crises and outright regress in the European Union. This was because we had not thought through the integrating uh, measures and could not answer some of the questions which, which were legitimately raised when a problem like the sovereign debt crisis or the refugee crisis came up. We risk running in more problems and dissatisfaction in some member states or in the European population at large if we cannot reassure the people in our member states that we are going the right way and that we have answers to the questions they pose. This fact that we do not have the right answers, to my assessment we don't, um, this fact may not only endanger the integrity of the European Union as we have it today, and as we can see it, um, that it has already taken its first toll in terms of Brexit. To save and preserve what we have achieved, we should stop rushing into unknown territory. There certainly is an optimal degree of integration along all of the dimensions that I mentioned earlier, but it may well be that we have more or less reached this optimal level or that we have even surpassed it. Let me conclude by a uh, historical observation. Europe has been torn into pieces by many, many wars. The greatest wars of the last 500 years were the Thirty Year War, the Napoleonic war, Wars, and the Two World Wars. By and large, all of these wars have had as their result a better alignment between nations and states, or between peoples and states. We've seen the creation of nation states. So it is quite likely that the identification between a nation and a state, or between a people and a state, whatever that may be, as the nationalists, that this identification is actually deeply rooted in Europeans. In fact, the peace we enjoy in Europe since 1945 may greatly have been fostered by the fact 
that by now most European states are nation states. Many wars they have actually developed around conflicts between nations within one single state. This is not to deny that the European Union has not also contributed greatly to this peace. But the European Union as we know it today has always respected the nation state and has taken care not to superimpose itself as something like the United States of Europe. According to my mind, uh, we would be well advised to abstain from any such initiative also in the future. Thank you very much.